just one day after his 26th birthday in August of 1988. Japanese native Tsutomu Miyazaki abducted four-year-old Mari Kono while she played at a friend's house. Miyazaki drove her to a secluded area and then the two of them sat in his car for several minutes before he strangled her to death. He then engaged in acts of necrophilia with her corpse before leaving her in the hills near his home. He then took pictures of her body parts, her clothes, and her teeth, which he'd removed, and sent the images to the girl's family in the form of a postcard. Mari was his first victim, and his next would come just a month later when he abducted Masami Yoshizawa, giving her the same treatment he'd given to Mari. Abduction, strangulation, assault, dismemberment, and a subsequent postcard sent to the family. He continued to target young girls, often luring them with promises of gifts or treats before assaulting and killing them. Miyazaki would then dissect their bodies and dispose of the remains in various locations, including in the woods or in the trash. Miyazaki's killings continued for over a year, and he is believed to have murdered at least four young girls in total. In June of 1989, he was finally caught by the police after one of his victims managed to escape and alert the authorities. When they searched Miyazaki's home, they discovered a gruesome scene, with dismembered body parts and photographs of the victims scattered throughout the house. Miyazaki was arrested and charged with the murders of the four girls and was found guilty on all counts. He was sentenced to death in 1997 and was hanged in June of 2008, nearly two decades after his crimes. Between the years of 1992 and 1999, Luis Garavito, also known as La Bestia, or The Beast, tortured and murdered anywhere from 100 to 400 young boys in Colombia, all between the ages of 6 and 16. While the official victim count is 138, the number he confessed to, police believe the number is upwards of 400, and they still continue to investigate to this day. Garavito preyed on the downtrodden orphaned or homeless boys who wandered the streets looking for food or shelter. When he came across a susceptible target, he would lure the boy away with promises of money, candy, or employment. Garavito would often dress himself to fit different personas when stalking the streets of 54 different Colombian towns, the places he used as hunting grounds. He'd dress as a farmer, a priest, or a street vendor, and ask the boys if they would like to help around his business the church, or his house. He made sure to switch disguises often to avoid suspicion by the locals. Once he successfully lured a boy away, he would attack, cornering the victim and binding their wrists, and then he'd torture them to an extent beyond imagination. Unfortunately, the beast killing spree would continue for a full five years until police even noticed the cases of the missing children. In 1997, an official investigation was launched after one of Garavito's mass graves was accidentally discovered. Some 25 corpses lay in the hole, and the scene was so gruesome that police initially thought a satanic cult was behind it. Then, in February of 1998, the bodies of three children were found on a hillside, lying next to each other, each with bound hands and slashed throats. They also found a murder weapon, and surprisingly, a note that contained a handwritten address. The address turned out to be Luis Garavito's girlfriend, and when police approached the house, Garavito wasn't home, but his girlfriend was, and she allowed police to access Garavito's belongings. There, they found countless pictures of young boys, detailed entries in a journal describing each of his crimes, and a list of tally marks counting each of his victims. A week later, Luis Garavito was arrested and sentenced to 1,853 years in prison a measly 13 years for each of his victims. Ahmad Siraji was an Indonesian serial killer who was active in the late 1980s and early 1990s. He is also known as the Witch Doctor Killer or the Sorcerer due to his claims that he was carrying out the orders of spirits who had commanded him to kill. Siraji is believed to have murdered at least 42 women during his killing spree, which lasted for over a decade. He was the son of a spiritual healer and grew up learning the traditional practices of his culture, including the use of magic and spells. As a young man, Siraji began practicing as a healer himself, and he quickly gained a reputation as a powerful and effective practitioner. In 
In 1986, Siraji claimed that he had received a vision from the spirits of his ancestors, including his father, who told him that he would become a great healer if he killed at least 70 young women and drank their saliva. Believing that he was carrying out the will of the spirits, Siraji began targeting young women, luring them to his farm with the promise of spiritual guidance. Once there, he would strangle them and bury them waist deep in a nearby sugarcane field, often returning to the graves to drink the saliva of the victims. Siraji's killings went undetected for over 10 years, and it wasn't until 1997 that authorities began to suspect that a serial killer was at work. In that year, the remains of several young women were discovered on Siraji's farm, and a subsequent investigation led to his arrest. Siraji was charged with the murders of 42 young women and was found guilty in 1998. He was sentenced to death by firing squad and was executed in July of 2008, over a decade after his crimes were committed. Eighteen-year-old Alexander Pachushkin killed his first victim in 1992, a schoolmate who had bullied him throughout his childhood. For the next few years, he would claim the lives of several victims, but these murders were committed sporadically until 2001 when Alexander had an idea. He wanted to kill 64 people, the same number as there are squares on a chessboard. It was then that his true murder spree began. Many of the victims were elderly homeless people whom Alexander would lure into Bitsesky Park in Moscow, promising free vodka and letting them drink as much as they wanted. Then, when an opportune moment presented itself, he would bludgeon them with a hammer, hitting them in the back of the head so hard it would create literal holes in their skulls. Alexander would then take the vodka bottle and shove the neck of the bottle into the gaping holes in their heads, his signature. Soon, he would expand his demographic targeting men, women, and even children, luring them into the park and attacking them from behind. By spring of 2006, nearly 50 people had vanished into Pitsevsky Park's birch trees, never to be seen or heard from again. And while the public perception was that of a monster, lurking in every shadow and preying on the weak, Alexander was actually spending his days working at a grocery store, chatting with hundreds of people, some were perhaps family members of the victims he'd already claimed. He was described by his co-workers as strange, but quiet. No one thought him dangerous or a risk, until Alexander decided to invite one of his co-workers to take a walk with him to the park. She was Marina Makalyova, and while she did have reservations about Alexander and his strange request, she didn't see him as enough of a threat to turn him down. She was, however, put off just enough to feel the need to tell her son where she was going, and also gave him Pichushkin's phone number. Marina wouldn't survive, but because of her foresight in giving her son the information, Alexander Pachushkin would soon be apprehended by police. In October of 2007, he was convicted of 49 murders and three attempted murders, giving him a total body count higher than most infamous serial killers combined. Alexander was unsatisfied with the judge's ruling and demanded the court recognize his kill count of 60, with three attempted. The judge handed him a life sentence, and Alexander Pachushkin would spend the first 15 years in solitary confinement. Yelena Zakhanova was found dead in September of 1978. She was nine years old, and when her body was discovered, it was obvious that she had been tortured. Drops of her blood had been discovered near the home of Andre Chikatilo, and the girl's backpack was found on a riverbank at the end of the street. Despite this evidence, and even witness testimony of a man who sounded like Chikatilo being at the bus stop with Yelena just before she died, the courts decided it was the fault of another local man who had recently committed a similar crime. No one was ever sure if Andre Chikatilo had done it or not, but what was certain was that Chikatilo now saw how easy it could be to get away with murder. And soon after Yelena Zakhanova's body was found, many more bodies began mysteriously appearing, showing all the same signs of torture that young Yelena had endured. The victims were transients, runaways, young victims that no one would miss. Chikatilo would wait at bus stops and train stations and lure the kids to his truck where he would stab them gag them, and occasionally mutilate their bodies with his teeth before killing and dumping their corpses, covering the evidence with leaves and debris. Despite the gruesome nature of the killings, Andre did have one fear, 
that his image might be imprinted on the eyes of his victims after death and that they could be used to identify him. Because of this, his signature included gouging the victim's eyes out, leaving nothing but a black void where hope and wonder had once lived. Andre Chikatilo murdered 56 children, most of them young girls, and it took over four years for police to convict him, having been forced to arrest and release the man multiple times due to loopholes in the legal system. But in 1990, nearly 20 years after his first murder, Chikatilo was coerced by a psychiatrist into giving a full confession for all 56 murders, surprising police since they were only aware of 36 of them. After 53 of the murders were verified, Andre Chikatilo went on trial and was convicted. On Valentine's Day in 1994, he was executed, the judge noting that this was the only sentence the killer deserved. Throughout the late 1980s, the 90s, and the early 2000s, Charles Edmund Cullen served as a nurse at various hospitals in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Over the course of those 16 years of employment, he slipped deadly amounts of drugs into many of his patients' IVs, killing them. 1993 marked the year of his first kill, three kills in fact, at Warren Hospital in Phillipsburg, New Jersey. He administered fatal doses of the drug digoxin to all three. Just before the last one had perished, she told her family that a male nurse had injected her with something, but her death was ruled as being the fault of cancer, and no formal investigation was launched. Charles Cullen resigned from the hospital shortly thereafter, and over the next nine years, he would bounce from hospital to hospital across New Jersey killing patients along the way. Sometimes he was fired, but most times he just left, and there was never any suspicion that fell on him due to a failed regulation system that wouldn't allow the sharing of information between hospitals. In 2002, a nurse at one of the hospitals where Charles Cullen had been employed contacted police over suspicion that Cullen had been killing his patients. She had a list of almost 70 patients that she was sure he'd murdered, but after a nine-month investigation, the police had nothing on Colin. Until 2003. In December of that year, officials at yet another hospital that currently employed Colin noticed an egregious number of patients who had died with lethal doses of digoxin in their blood. They immediately fired Colin, but after an internal review, they were forced to notify authorities of their findings. Cullen admitted and pled guilty to 22 murders and three attempted murders in New Jersey. During the trial, Cullen refused to acknowledge the families of his victims and even pretended to be asleep at his table. While he only ended up confessing to around 40 people, investigators believe the number could be around 400 victims, but without substantial evidence or a direct confession, the families may never get the answers they so desperately seek. When Patrick Wayne Kearney was 13 years old, his father taught him how to slaughter pigs. But Kearney enjoyed the act a bit too much, and before long, he was killing pigs that weren't supposed to be slaughtered, and then he would proceed to roll around in their blood and covered himself with the pig's intestines. After a childhood full of bullying due to his strange demeanor and short stature, Kearney finally graduated and then joined the Air Force. It was there that he would meet David Hill, and the two men would start a love affair despite the fact that Hill was married. After Kearney was discharged from the Air Force, he and Hill moved to California, but soon they were arguing and fighting more frequently than was comfortable for David Hill. So eventually he left Kearney and went back to his wife. In turn, Patrick Kearney filled his time with purposeful drives past local gay bars in California, but Kearney was looking for something far more sinister than a casual encounter. One night in 1962, Patrick Kearney was on his motorcycle when he saw a young man around 19 years of age hitchhiking. Kearney gave the boy a ride, drove to a secluded area, and shot him in the head behind the ear, just like he'd done to so many pigs in his teenage years. After the unidentified man was dead, Kearney performed acts of necrophilia on the body. He would murder his next victim in the same way, luring him to a remote spot, shooting him, and then assaulting the corpse. Kearney added only one more victim to his body count that year, yet another teenage male picked up off the street. But the next year, David Hill left his wife and returned to Kearney, and the two men settled in Culver City, California. 
All was quiet until 1967, when Kearney and Hill went to visit one of David Hill's friends in Mexico. Late into the night, Kearney gave in to his impulses and snuck into David Hill's friend's bedroom and shot him between the eyes. He dragged the corpse to a bathtub and assaulted the body, and then began dismembering it with a knife. He dug the slug out of the man's skull and disposed of the body before returning to California. In 1971, David Hill left again, but by now, Patrick Kearney had perfected his methods. Over the next six years, he would murder dozens of hitchhikers, prostitutes, men from bars, and even children as young as eight years old. His methods still consisted of the seclusion, the gun, the assault, and the dismemberment. But now, he would stuff all the body parts into a heavy-duty trash bag and then dump those bags in different places, including freeways and dumpsters. He tried to be careful, but he wasn't careful enough, and in 1977, Patrick Wayne Kearney was finally caught when police matched hair samples on one of the trash bags he'd used to dispose of a victim. Kearney eventually confessed to 35 murders. Due to his cooperation with the police, the death penalty was waived. Instead, Patrick Kearney was given life in prison and still remains there to this day. Dennis Lynn Rader grew up in a humble home in Wichita, Kansas, but unlike most children his age, Dennis had a dark side. While most young teenagers in Wichita were riding bicycles, fishing, or one of any number of other outdoor activities, Dennis Rader spent his time hanging and torturing stray animals. Somehow, he was able to conceal his sinister desires and fantasies long enough to graduate, serve a full duty in the Air Force, become an electrician, and then marry a woman Paula Dietz, whom he'd met at his church. By all outward appearances, Dennis Rader was a normal, ordinary man. But in 1973, after he was laid off from his electrician job, Dennis broke into the home of a local family, the Oteros, and forced the children, 9-year-old Joseph and 11-year-old Josie, to watch while he strangled their parents. Then, he turned on the children and drugged them to the basement and hung them from a sewer pipe. Raider took pictures of the bodies and then returned home to his wife. In the morning, the couple woke and readied themselves for church. A few months later, Raider went after his next victims, a college student named Catherine Bright and her brother Kevin. Raider stabbed and strangled the girl, then shot Kevin twice, but somehow Kevin survived, only he was unable to identify his attacker. It was then that Dennis began to confess his crimes, but not in the way that most might think. Raider wrote a letter detailing the murder of the Otero family, and he hid the paper inside a book at the Wichita Public Library. Then, he called the Wichita Eagle, a local paper, and told them where the confession could be found. He also told them that he fully intended to kill again, and that his name was BTK, which stood for Bind, Torture, Kill. But then, when Dennis found out his wife Paula was pregnant, he decided to take some time off from killing. He was excited about the prospect of what a baby would bring to their lives, and over the next few years, he found himself too busy to be BTK. But that busyness could only last for so long, and soon the BTK killer would strike again. This time in 1977, when he strangled his next victim, Shirley Vianne, while her six-year-old son watched through a keyhole. Also in 1977, 25-year-old Nancy Fox would be stalked and murdered by BTK. He then took another extended break, and in 1985, Dennis Rader had been living a quieter life. He'd become a Boy Scout leader for his son's scout group. He'd also become heavily involved in church activities and outreach, even befriending 53-year-old widow Maureen Hedge, who had lived on the same block as Dennis for the past 30 years. But things were not what they seemed. One night, in April of that year, as Dennis chaperoned a scout camping trip, he snuck off in the night, broke into Maureen's house, and strangled her. In all, BTK would kill 10 people, including 28-year-old Vicki Wegerly in 1986 and Dolores Davis in 1991. He continued to send taunting letters to police and the paper throughout the 80s and then in the early 90s, but then BTK went silent for over a decade. And in 2004, on the 30th anniversary of the Otero murders, BTK wanted to mark the occasion with another round of letters and taunting packages sent between March 2004 and February 2005, the last of which was a floppy disk sent to a local television station 
But what BTK didn't know was that this disc would lead detectives directly to Dennis Rader's church and then ultimately to his house. With DNA evidence given to police by Rader's daughter, they were able to match Rader to his crimes and BTK was finally caught in February of 2005. Dennis Rader confessed to all 10 murders and even wore a look of psychotic joy when he described all the brutal details of his attacks. BTK was sentenced to 175 years in prison without the possibility of parole and only escaped the death penalty because at the time, Kansas had no death penalty instated. In early 1949, a warehouse owned by John George Haig was raided by police. Inside, they discovered an array of 40-gallon drums, each filled with sulfuric acid. Outside the warehouse, they found almost 30 pounds of melted human body fat, human gallstones, dentures, and even a foot. There was no mistaking what Haig had done. But what would become more shocking to police throughout the investigation was that this wasn't the first time that he'd done this. and. He had fully planned to do it again, and probably would have gotten away with all of it if it weren't for one small mistake. In 1939, Haig was serving four years in prison for fraud. It was there that he discovered the accounts of French murderer George Alexandre Serret, who was known for dissolving his victims in sulfuric acid. This was exactly the information that John Haig needed, as he blamed his current incarceration on the fact that he had left his victims alive and had been devising ways to kill and dispose of future victims when he was released in a few short years. And he did exactly that. Four years later, Haig was released and took a job at an engineering firm. There, he reconnected with an old acquaintance, William McSwan, who had been living a carefree life as a landlord. Haig became jealous of the man's lifestyle, and a few months later, he lured McSwan into an abandoned basement and bludgeoned him in the head. And then, armed with the knowledge that he'd gained in prison, he put McSwan's corpse into a drum and filled it with sulfuric acid. And days later, there was nothing left of McSwan except a hundred pounds of putrid sludge, which Haig simply dumped down a manhole. John George Haig would then kill William McSwan's family and dissolve them. He then killed two homeowners when he'd faked interest in buying their house and dissolved them. After these murders, Haig purchased a warehouse where he could store his barrels. He would then befriend a wealthy widow named Olive Deacon and eventually lured her to the warehouse, where he killed her and put her in a barrel just like the victims before her. But after Olive had been fully dissolved, Haig found that his warehouse location had no easy access to the sewers and thus he was unable to dispose of the sludge in the sewers like he'd done before. He was forced to dump the liquefied remains of Olive Deacon in a rubble pile not far from the building and these were the remains discovered by investigators not long after the fact. Egg attempted to plead insanity, but it took the jury only a few minutes to find him guilty, and in August of 1949, John George Haig was executed for his crimes. Tommy Lynn Sells claimed the lives of over 70 people in the United States. A vagabond of sorts, the media referred to Sells as the coast-to-coast -coast killer, but most knew him as the brutal Texan. Often left alone at home by his mother when he was young, Tommy spent much of his childhood fending for himself. He rarely went to school and started drinking alcohol at the age of seven. At eight, he was taken advantage of by an older man. At ten, he dropped out of school and turned to drugs and even more alcohol. His mother, disgusted with his behavior, packed up Tommy's siblings and abandoned Tommy, leaving him on his own for good. He began moving from town to town, doing what he could to survive, understandably filled with rage after his mother's abandonment. At 16, he claimed his first and second murders. He then moved to Arkansas in 1981 and killed another two there. Then in 1986, he was convicted of carjacking and served nine months of a two-year sentence before being released. And this was when he would go on a vicious murder spree that would make him one of the most prolific serial killers in American history. Tommy Sells hopped trains, and at every stop, he would brutally murder several people. A mother and her four-year-old son in Missouri, two young women in California, a 20-year-old woman in Nevada, and a 27-year-old woman in New York. After New York, Tommy Sells ended up hitchhiking in Illinois when a man named Keith Dardine stopped to offer him a ride. 
After some brief conversation, Keith invited Tommy back to his house to have dinner with his family. After he finished eating, Cell stood, said thank you to the family, and then shot Keith Dardine dead and then mutilated him. He then took out his rage on Keith's three-year-old son Pete, and then beat Keith's pregnant wife to death with a baseball bat. Unfortunately, this heinous crime would go unsolved for more than a decade. On New Year's Eve, 1999, 13-year-old Kayleen Harris and her 10-year-old friend, Crystal Searles, lay in Kayleen's room, talking about things most important to girls of that age. Tommy Sells entered through the window in Kayleen's bedroom. He grabbed Kayleen, slashing her throat and killing her instantly. He did the same to Crystal, dropping her to the floor and leaving her for dead. But unbeknownst to Tommy, Crystal survived. She pretended to be dead until the monster had left, and then she ran to a neighbor's house and contacted the police. On January 2nd, 2000, Tommy Lynn Sells was arrested and confessed to killing over 70 people in the U.S. But finally, after a 20-year murder spree, authorities were able to close the book on this cold-blooded killer's rampage. This concludes today's submission to the Dark Omnibus. If you're in need of more strange and scary stories, be sure to watch this video and hear the true accounts of numerous dark spirits that once pretended to be a child's imaginary friend. Until next time, Dark Ones.